Birch, thanks for joining for the so-and-so show. Hope you guys had a great week and hope you enjoy John, Brandon, and Kellen. All right, see you guys later. Bye. I'm John, and welcome back to the joy of art. Today we're going to take something beautiful, something perfect, something delicious, a real work of art, the circus peanut, and use it to create a whole new piece of art. Let's give it a try, shall we? Just look at these happy little circus peanuts. They're all saying, hey, come to the circus. It's an amazing place. There's a person here who can wrestle squirrels and another who can shoot fire out their ears. Isn't that wonderful? Now what we're going to do is just get them a little sticky. Hmm. Just like that. Isn't that nice? It tastes like delicious fake orange. Yummy. Once it's sticky, place it anywhere on the canvas. Let the circus peanut tell you where it wants to go. Mm-hmm. Happy. 
There we go. Oh, perfect. Just like that. Now continue the process. This is gonna be fun. <laughs> Circus peanut. Oh, okay. I hear you, Circus Peanut friends. <laughs> they're telling me my art is done and they're ready to be seen. Why don't we take a look at what we've created? Oh, huh. I think I'll call this piece Sad Clown at the Circus. Because doesn't he look like a happy little sad clown? <laughs> I love it when the art comes to life like that. Show. I'm Brandon, that's John, Me. and we are excited about today's show. Well, as always, yeah. except that today is something special. Yeah. Today we get to announce something we've been working on for, for years. Yeah, months even. You see, John and I have a little pet project. Yeah, but that pet project has grown into a full-size St. Bernard, and <laughs> we can no longer keep it hidden inside his little crate. It's time for it to be set free! With up-to-date shots, a license, and a proper leash, of course. Of course, of course. Should I tell them? Oh yeah, be my guest. <laughs> okay, so you may have noticed Brandon and I are wearing these amazing and handsome looking turtlenecks. That's because, drum roll! Our very first musical, Warm Necks, the history of the turtleneck is finally getting produced! <gasps> <laughs> You heard him right. John and I have been working tirelessly on bringing the amazing and fascinating history of the turtleneck to musical life. Yeah, let's give him a little taste. Oh, you think so? I do. Oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it started in the dark ages when knights suffered severe chafing while wearing chainmail. As a result, a garment that could protect the neck and torso from rough and heavy metal was born. It's the Dark Age life for us. It's the Dark Age life for us. Instead of cheering, we get chafed. Instead of knighthood, we're disgraced. It's, it's the, the Dark, dark Age, Age life. life. In the 1700s, the turtleneck switched from being a status symbol to something more practical and worn in the winter. Let it snow, let it snow, this turtleneck can grow. Then, in the 1800s, the fashion moved into the sports world, where the first football uniforms were not v-necks, but the illustrious turtleneck. Oh, 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 oh. We don't talk about v-necks, next, next, next. We don't talk about v-necks. In the 1950s, the fashion world was trying to get rid of the outdated turtleneck. But the hero of our story, Finn Maurice Bambana, an artist born in South Detroit, with nothing but a cold neck and a dream, kept the turtleneck alive. I am not throwing away my shirt. I am not throwing away my shirt. Even though it may look silly, keeps my neck from being chilly. And I'm not throwing away my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was just a taste and a moose bouche, if you will. A warm next to the history of the turtleneck. Ooh, boy. <laughs> it's, it's a heartbreaking yet hilarious tale of the endearing garment and the people who wore it. And it's going to be coming to an off, off, off Broadway theater, not near or possibly near you. Yeah. Is oh, that you? Yeah, yeah, that's me. Okay, that's right. It's the producer. Ooh. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> Yellow, it's John. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, great. That sounds good. We'll do that. We'll see ya. <laughs> what did he say? He just called to say he's not producing the musical. <laughs> but on a positive note, there's a positive note? He said he was sure there was someone out there who could possibly like it somewhere. Great. <laughs> yeah, that's the last time we try something like that. <laughs>
It's Bible story time with Kellen. <laughs> Hey guys, man, it was tough to hear about your turtleneck musical. I really thought you had something there. Yeah, we did too. Yeah, pretty disappointed. Thanks for bringing it up again. You got a story for us? I do, and maybe it will help. It's about two brothers who had a pretty rocky relationship, but really it's about a bigger plan. This is the story of two brothers, Jacob and Esau. This wasn't a part of my plan. Betrayal, anger revenge, and a dream that would change the world forever. Wow. All this and more on Behind the Bible. Jacob and Esau were the two sons of Isaac and Rebekah. Though they were twins, they were very different. Esau loved hunting and being outside, while Jacob enjoyed cooking and being indoors. I think I should point out here that Esau was just a little bit older than Jacob. And at that time, being the firstborn son in the family was a big deal. It was a big deal. Yeah, I know. I, I just... Just like narrating stories is a big deal to me, by myself, without interruption. Oh, carry on. As the firstborn... Esau had the birthright to become the leader of the family when his father died. But Jacob came up with a plan to take the birthright for himself. This is going to make me sound kind of sneaky, but hey, I saw an opportunity and I took it. You see, I was making this red lentil stew one day when Esau came in from outside and he was hungry. Yeah, I was hungry. Hadn't eaten for, I don't know, Hours, felt like days. And when I came in and smelled that stew, I was like, well, I gotta have some of that, now. So I said, you want some stew? Fine, sell me your birthright. And he did. Yeah, I was like, I'm practically dying of hunger right now. What good is a birthright if I'm not allowed to use it? Give me some of that stew, so. So I sold my birthright to Jacob. Stew was good, though. For just a bowl of stew, Esau traded all of his rights as the oldest son to his brother, Jacob. But that wasn't the last time Jacob took something that belonged to Esau. Later, Listen, I didn't go to four years of narrator college for nothing. Just let me do my job. There's a narrator college? Later, when Jacob and Esau's father was very old, he called Esau to his side. Dad was old. He was weak. Couldn't see very well. And he said to me, Son, I don't know when I'm going to die. Go hunting for me and cook me a meal. Then, then, I'll give you my blessing before I die. So I went out hunting. Didn't think for a second Jacob would betray me. Yeah, so I know parents aren't supposed to have favorites, but mom liked me best. And when she overheard my father promising to bless Esau, she wasn't satisfied. She wanted my father to bless me instead. Now, we're twins and my father didn't see so well, so she thought I could just pretend to be Esau. But he has way more hair than me. So she covered me with the skins of a goat. That way, my skin would seem hairy like Esau's. And it worked. I told my father I was Esau, and he believed me. And he gave me his blessing. Jacob had bought Esau's birthright for a bowl of stew, and then he tricked Esau out of his father's blessing. And when Esau found out... I was so mad! I wanted to... I wanted to... I was so mad. I'm pretty sure Esau wanted to kill me after that. So, I ran away. Yeah, so Jacob hadn't been a very good brother. He lied, tricked, and manipulated to get what he wanted. You know what I want? Yeah, yeah, narrator, college. And... Jacob ran away from home, and he found himself alone in the middle of nowhere with nothing but a rock for a pillow. 
As he slept, something amazing happened. I had a dream, a vision from God. You know, there was this big stairway and it reached all the way to heaven and there were angels going up and down the stairs and the Lord was standing there. The Lord said, I am the Lord of your grandfather Abraham and the God of your father Isaac. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth that can't be counted. All nations will be blessed because of you and your family. I am with you. I will watch over you everywhere you go. After all I'd done, all the sneaky stuff, the lies, God promised to still be with me. I had been trying to make things happen on my own, but God had a bigger plan for me. So I took my rock pillow and set it up as a sacred stone. And I promised right then and there to have faith in God. God really did have a bigger plan for Jacob and his family, a plan to bless the whole world. One of Jacob's descendants was Jesus, who died to pay for the sins of the world. Did Jacob make bad choices? Yes. Could Jacob still be a part of God's plan? A hundred percent yes. God loves us no matter what, and you can trust that God has a plan. That was really good. Which narrator college did you go to? Oh, um, self-taught. Ah. This has been Behind the Bible. Goodbye. What'd you guys think? Well, I love that Jacob wasn't even close to being perfect, and yet he was still part of God's big plan. I think it's great just to be reminded that there is a plan. Yep, because you're going to have disappointments and bad days. It's going to happen. But what we can trust is that God has an ultimate plan to make things right in the world. And that hasn't and won't change. Good to know. Thanks, Kellen. You bet. I'll see you guys next time. You know, I uh, am disappointed about the musical, but I'm not going to give up. Yeah. We've only tried one producer yeah. and one musical. We, we've got way more ideas in us. We could, we could write a musical about tube socks. Yeah, or jorts. Or some non-clothing item, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, but the important thing to remember is that God has always had a plan. So we can put our trust in God. Right on. So yeah. reveal the question. Why are plans important? Uh, well, if you're planning for a trip, it helps to know where you're going, <laughs> how to pack, what snacks to take. Or when you're planning to build something, mm -hmm. it's great to know what tools you'll need and the order to put things together. Mm -hmm. oh, when someone has a plan, it's easier to trust them because they've put thought into where they're going and what they're doing. So talk about it with each other. Why are plans important? And we'll see you next week for a brand new show. See ya. They are short. Bring me joy!